The Story of Civilization, Part 2, The Life of Greece, being a history of Greek civilization from the beginnings, and of civilization in the Near East, from the death of Alexander to the Roman conquest, with an introduction on the prehistoric culture of Crete by Will Durant, Chapter 7, Section 3, Xenophanus of Alea, west of Crotana lies the site of ancient Locri. The colony was founded, says Aristotle, by the runaway slaves, adulterers, and thieves from Locris in mainland Greece. Perhaps Aristotle had an old world disdain for the new, suffering disorder from the defects of their qualities, the colonists applied to the oracle at Delphi for advice, and were told to get themselves laws. Possibly, Seleucus had instructed the oracle for about 664 BCE. He gave to Locri ordinances, which, as he said, Athena had dictated to him in a dream. This was the first written code of laws in the history of Greece, though not the first to be handed down by what they considered to be gods. The Locrians liked it so well that they required any man who wished to propose a new law to speak with a rope around his neck, so that if his motion failed, he might be hanged with a minimum of public inconvenience. I don't know about killing those that fail politically, but... Rounding the toe of Italy, northward, the traveler reaches flourishing Regio, founded by the Messians about 730 BCE under the name of Rachian, and known to the Romans as Regium, slipping through the straits of Messina, probably the Scala, and Krabdis of the Odysseus, one comes to where Laos stood, and then to ancient Ha'ela, the Roman Vilia, known to history as Elea, because Plato wrote it so, and because only its philosophers are remembered. There, Xenophanes of Colophon came about 510 and founded the Adiatic School. And the Greeks were so fond of the fable about the Locrians that they told it also of the laws of Catana and There. The plan was especially pleasing to Michel de Montaigne and may not have outlived its utility. He was a personality as unique as his favorite foe, Thoris, a man of dauntless energy and reckless initiative. He wandered for 67 years, he tells us, up and down the land of Hellas, making observations and enemies everywhere. He wrote and recited philosophical poems, denounced Homer for his impious ribaldry, laughed at superstition, found a port in Adia, and obstinately completed a century before he died. Homer and Hesiod, saying Stephanus, have ascribed to the gods all details that are a shame and disgrace among men, thieving, adultery, and fraud. Which leads one to question what people mean by God more than ever because of such things, right? But he himself was not a pillar of orthodoxy. There never was, nor ever will be, any man who knows with certainty the things about the gods. Mortals fancy that gods are born and wear clothes and have voice and form like themselves. Yet if oxen and lions had hands and could paint and fashion images as men do, they would make the pictures and images of their gods in their own likeness. Well, maybe they wouldn't be so silly about that sort of thing, but 
horses would make them like horses, oxen like oxen, Ethiopians make their gods black and snub-nosed, Thracians gave theirs blue eyes and red hair. There is one god supreme among gods and men, resembling mortals neither in form nor in mind. The whole of him sees, the whole of him thinks, the whole of him hears. Without toil, he rules all things by the power of his mind. This god, says Evgenis Lartius, was identified by Xenophanes with the universe. All things, even men, thought the philosopher, are derived from earth and water by natural laws. Water once covered nearly all the earth, for marine fossils are found far inland and on mountaintops, and at some future time water will probably cover the whole earth again. Nevertheless, all change in history and all separateness in things are superficial phenomena. Beneath the flux and variety of forms is an unchanging unity which is the innermost reality of God. From this starting point, Sinopanus is a disciple. Hermenides of Elia proceeded to the idealistic philosophy, which was in turn to mold the thought of Plato and Platonists throughout antiquity, and of Europe even to this day. Hermenides.